Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Janina Jeff, staff scientist at Illumina. I work in bioinformatics. My name is Mayana Zatz. I am a, a professor of genetics in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. I direct a human genome and stem cell research center. And I'm very happy to share this conversation with you because I think that bioinformatics is extremely important when we study genome. Of people genomes. Yeah, uh, it's so funny. We were all so excited about how the cost of uh, whole genome sequencing is going down. And in the early stages, everyone forgot to account for the cost of bioinformatics, which is a huge part, right? We get all this data and now we have to analyze all this data. And how are we going to analyze all this that's, data? <laughs> that's the big problem because, because I, I was talking to my colleague today and said, well, we can do the genome. But the big thing now is to analyze the to genome. To analyze the genome. Yes. How do we make sense of it? Yes. And then another thing we've been talking about lately is now how do we educate everyone else on all the things that we've learned from the genome. Not easy. Not I, easy no, at all. I teach medical students. And I oh, you do? Tell, yes. Okay. So I can tell you <laughs> that it's not easy. But and uh, trying to translate what we do in a language that people, lay people can understand is, is a, a big challenge. And that's one of the things I like doing and, and do a lot. I, I do a lot of education work in the community and just making sure that we make genetics accessible, not just through technology, but also through language. Um, and making sure that we teach genetics culturally relevant and we make sure that it's culturally attuned. And so I think it's really important that we kind of incorporate these things in our, into our practices. So you're so, so an extension of the amazing work that you're doing. Well, I, I, I'm very much involved in uh, genetic disorders. Yes. Particularly uh, neuromuscular disorders, muscular dystrophies. So uh, for us to doing the genome study, to identify the mutation that, that caused that disease, and then to do the genetic counseling. So each time you find a mutation, you can string the whole family and see if there are other people that are at risk and prevent the, the birth of other uh, affected children. Uh, so this is one part that is very important, not only the diagnosis, but what can be done immediately to prevent all the, the birth of, of other children? The benefit of being able to do that. Yes, yes. And, and so when we, when we educate the community on what we're learning, um, they now can see the benefit that we all see, which makes them more engaged, right? I wanted to ask you a little bit, because um, you're, you're based in Brazil, yes. and uh, one of the things we're really passionate about at Illumina in, in genomics is making genomics accessible. And I was just curious, um, some of the work that you've done, how, what kind of challenges have you faced in using sequencing technology um, in underrepresented parts of the world like Brazil? Well. <laughs> The cost. The, the cost. cost. <laughs> it's very expensive for yes, us. It's, it's really true. very expensive. And we can do much, much more. We have big cores that are characterized phenotypically, and we could uh, genome uh, screen them to do the whole genome, but we don't have the resources to that. Okay. So we hope very much that Illumina will help us. Yes. To Illumina will help us to, to give uh, more uh, resources, more support, uh, so we can do that. Uh, because our population is really unique. Uh, we found uh, this on um, this study that was just published, two million variants wow. that were not uh, deposited in the UK banks or, or, or other banks because of all this mixed population that we have. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important part, right? That there are so many different crevices, I like to say, in the genome that we don't know about just because we've never studied it. Exactly. Right? Um, and I was reading some of your work, especially around muscular dystrophy, and I, I read that you were able to return some results to some families uh, and change their perspective. So. How do you think when we make these discoveries, like the two million variants that you were able to discover, how does this change the field of genomics? Well, uh, particularly, I'm interested now to find uh, variants that I call protective variants. 
And uh, for example, I was involved now with COVID, with a third, and we studied a set of people that were very interested. First, couples uh, that I call discordant couples, mm -hmm. where one was at sick and the other one, the wife or the husband, living together without any protection, did, didn't uh, get anything. Uh, so we studied the genome of these people and we found some variants that could explain the resistance. And then we extended the study, it's going to be published now, with uh, nonagenarians and centenarians oh, wow. that were also had COVID very mildly affected or even asymptomatic. I, I, the last person that I studied was a, a man that is 106 years old. Wow. He lives in Brasilia, not in Sao Paulo, and, uh, but I went to visit him. He's cognitively very, very healthy. And his wife, he calls his young wife, who is 89 years old, <laughs> <laughs> got COVID. Mm -hmm. And he was together with her and he didn't have anything. So I'm very interested now to understand these protective uh, genes, these protective variants, what they do, because uh, I think that they can, uh, they can explain why some people have pathogenic mutations and are very mildly affected, while others have the same mutation can be severely affected. I think that's really important. Um, one of the things that we've seen happen going back to representation is that a lot of the annotations that we say are pathogenic um, may not really even be pathogenic, right? Other mutations might be protective and there's just so much that we don't know. So I'm really happy that you're doing that work. And when you were talking earlier about how you did some of this, how you were doing this work in elder populations, the first thing that popped in my head was epigenetics. Yes. So are you, are you doing any epigenetics work and, and what type of work are you doing? Well, what, what we are doing now, we have generated iPS cells from centenarians that were resistant and uh, uh, we are going to we differentiate the iPS cells in different cell lines. So we are doing cardiac cells, muscle cells, uh, neuro, uh, neuronions, and um, lung cells. And we're going to infect these cells uh, with the two variants of the, of the SARS-CoV-2, the uh, Omicron and the uh, Delta. Okay. And we are going to do all the omics in these cell lines to try to understand uh, what the mechanism these people have to be to resist, have protective resist. to be protective. That's yes. so amazing. And, and we hope that maybe this can uh, help us to understand uh, not only the resistance against uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, but other infections that can can come in the future. Yeah, because if you live to be 106, you must you must not get the common flu that often. <laughs> yes. Right. And I mean, I think the most hopeful thing about this, and I think something that a lot of people don't talk about, is that when we do work in populations that are understudied, in this case, uh, elder populations, we understand these mechanisms, like in the case of what you're doing, the mechanisms of protection, and we can use these as tools for preventative medicine and precision medicine, exactly. right? These now become potential drug targets or potential pathways to help us resolve some of the common diseases and things that help us could help us live longer. And so it's really, really inspiring. I have one last question, not science related question. Um, I've been reading about your work the last couple of days and I'm just so impressed and you know very inspired. And I just wanted to know what type of inspiration do you have for other women in science who are doing good work and how can we take something from the work that you're doing to... Well, I think it's fantastic to be a scientist. I love it. I think it's something that you are always involved with because what moves us are the questions. Yes. And each time you answer a question, you have many other questions. And uh, in Brazil, uh, the good thing is that there is no discrimination against women scientists. Mm. We have the same opportunities, the same salaries. Oh, well, that's amazing to hear. And I'm glad to hear that. That gives us all hope. Um, so thank you so much for sitting with me and telling me about your amazing work and sharing your story. I just want to say a, a, the last thing. Yeah. Uh, when we study, uh, when you know about longevity. Yes. That 
maybe 20% uh, of uh, is uh, genetics, 80% is environment. But when you study people that are 90 uh, years old or older, the genetics is much more important. Yeah. So that's why I think we, we should focus on this and try to understand what are the genes that can make people live a long life to be a, a healthy centenarian. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with you, you know, studying uh, these extremes of, you know, the distribution is where all the genetic information lies, right? Exactly. That's where the low hanging fruit is. So that's such a smart, smart way of going about this. I can't wait to read the book you have on the genetics of aging <laughs> and how we can all live longer. Yes. Yeah. Long and healthy. And healthy. Yes, and health happy. span, not only <laughs> lifespan. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you.